Good morning. How are we doing, church? Good. Hey, my name is Alex, and I'm one of the pastors here at Fellowship Bible. And man, uh, before we dive in, uh, I just want to say a quick shout out to, uh, to Clay and to Dixie, who led last week, and Ben and Dixie, who led uh, today, uh, so that I could be out for a week with uh, my wife, who had a pretty significant major surgery about 10 days ago, and so I was her nurse. I was her caretaker. Um, so you should pray for her. Um, <laughs> no, she is at home and recovering well, might even be watching on TV uh, right now with my mother-in-law, and if so, hey, babe, how are you? Uh, it's good to see you. Uh, <laughs> But uh, she, she's doing really well. Um, it, it's been awesome to be on, on this side of receiving ministry. So often as a pastor, you spend a lot of your time ministering and pastoring and shepherding and caring for others. And so uh, just to be very transparent with you, when we have dealt with something like this, you all have been so kind. Uh, our calendar has been full of, of meals within... Uh, minutes of releasing the meal calendar. It was already full, and because it was already full, uh, some of you were kind of upset about that, that you didn't get in on bringing a meal, and so then you started bringing meals for like breakfast and other times and not dinners, and so I've gained five pounds uh, in the last uh, 10 days, And uh, but sincerely, uh, beyond the meals, your, your calls, your emails, your text messages, just you're pulling me aside, uh, asking how Wendy's doing, all of those things. It's, it's been a, a great comfort to us. And so thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Uh, if you have your Bible, please turn with me to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. And while you're turning there, let me ask you a question. Do you know or did you know that the most widely known Bible verse in the country besides John 3.16 is not actually a Bible verse? I mean, we all know John 3.16, but the most popular, at least what, what people think uh, is a Bible verse, is actually uh, not in the Bible at all, and it's the phrase, God helps those who help themselves. Um, an astounding 82% of Americans think that verse is in the Bible. Those words are not in the Bible. Uh, in fact, those words were spoken by the great American scientist, inventor, uh, what else could I say about him? Statesman, diplomat, printer, publisher, um, political philosopher, Benjamin Franklin. And what I find even more amazing is that 81% of those who identify as Christians also believe that that's in the Bible. While I'm sharing stats, here's a few more. According to the Gallup organization from, from a, a survey they did about five years ago, back in 2019, one-third of Americans don't know who delivered the Sermon on the Mount. In fact, a large percentage uh, of Christians thought that Billy Graham was the one who gave <laughs> the Sermon on the Mount. And if anybody besides Jesus was going to give the Sermon on the Mount, it probably would have been Billy Graham, but it wasn't Billy Graham. In the same poll, fewer than half could name the first book in the Bible. And then at the conclusion of the study, the Gallup organization uh, made this startling statement. They said this, it appears as Americans, we revere the Bible, we just don't read it. Now, I know I'm preaching to the choir uh, since this is a Bible church, right? I know that you guys are different. You truly are. You love the scripture. You love the exposition of the Bible, and you've come to expect that here over the years. That's one of uh, the things I love about being the pastor here is that you love God's word. So a series like we've been doing is, I think, extremely helpful because what we've tried to do over the last five weeks is to rediscover and remind ourselves of the biblical vision of the global church with the capital C and our local church. And today in this final message in this series, we're going to talk about um, that our house, our local church should be built on God's word. And so, turning to Acts chapter 2, and in particular, verse 42, I want to examine today just one half of one verse. 
Oftentimes, uh, when we preach expositionally around here, expository preaching, we will preach through a chunk of Scripture. Uh, And today, I just want to look at one half of one verse. But I want to drill deep. And ultimately, what I want you to see today is I want you to see how important the early church's relationship was with the Scripture, with God's Word. And so as we look at this one half of one verse, I'm going to give you three statements or three decisions that we need to make concerning the scriptures. But before I do that, uh, let me give you a little context of where we find ourselves in Acts chapter 2. It's the day of Pentecost. And if you're not sure what that is, Pentecost is the day that the church was Born. It was the day that the church was officially established, where they put the cornerstone. You know, you build a church, you put the cornerstone in, it was founded on such and such date. This is that day. It occurred 50 days after Passover. It's the day the Holy Spirit descended on a group of 120 believers that were gathered together in a room just weeks after the death and resurrection of Jesus. And uh, as a result uh, of this, the Holy Spirit uh, coming upon these believers, quite a commotion uh, happens. We're going to read about that here in just a minute. But as a result of this, Peter, um, the apostle Peter, goes outside and he preaches a sermon to the Jews in Jerusalem, and something really amazing happens. Look at chapter 2, verse 41. It says this, so those who accepted his and that being Peter, his message, Peter's message, were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 people were added to them. Okay, <clears throat> to, to, be, like, to be honest with you, as a pastor, I get giddy uh, when there's new faces that show up on a Sunday. Like the last couple of weeks, it's been really amazing. Letourneau's back uh, in session, and we had like a dozen students, brand new students the week before, uh, a dozen brand new students last week. We probably have a few more uh, faces that are here today, maybe even some families. I mean, I, I get giddy when that happens. I get really jazzed and excited. The staff does, the elders do. When, when someone we've been ministering to or discipling gives their life to Christ, steps over the line of faith, get, um, you know, pr- um, gives their life to Jesus, professes him, confesses him as Lord and Savior of their life, enters the baptism waters like we did last month. We had a few people do in the service. I get really giddy when those things happen. That is super exciting. Exciting. New visitors, new believers is exciting, but 3,000 in one day. Hmm. I mean, truly, I mean, I would love for us to have that problem, but make no mistake, it would be a logistical nightmare. And I've often wondered what was going through the disciples' mind, their minds, when this day of Pentecost happens. Like, what happened in the ap- aftermath? Like, what do we do with these 3,000 people? You know, like now what? What, what? What's next? What's their next step? What do, we, what do we train them to do? What do they need to know? What, what, are, what are we going to, do we impart, what are the things that we impart on them so that they can grow and thrive and survive and, and mature in this new faith we call Christianity or that time the way? Well, we get the answer in verse 42. It says this. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. That's the one half of the one verse that I want to cover today. But let's indulge ourselves and we'll finish the verse, right? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. But we're going to look at the first half of that verse, and we're going to look at that first half of that verse in reverse, And so let me give you the first statement for those that are taking notes, uh, give you the first statement, the first decision we need to make to ensure that in our house we have a heart for God's word, and it's this, to grow you must learn. To grow you must learn. Notice it says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And so since we're taking this one half of one verse in reverse, let's focus in on that word teaching. The word in the original Greek for the word teaching is pronounced didache. It, it, it looks like uh, didache or, or didache, D-I-D-A-C-H-E, but it's pronounced didache. And, and that word means teaching 
or it means doctrine. That's another great translation of that word. Or ultimately, it's just that which is taught. So, so it's teaching, it's doctrine, or, or the things, it's the content, the things that are taught. And we will get to what they were teaching in just a moment. But for now, I want you to see the emphasis just on teaching and doctrine. Um, this is so important because I have a concern that there's really an absence of theology in many churches today. Like there's an absence of biblical knowledge coming from lots of pulpits and churches in our country. It is all too prevalent. Uh, in America, that many pastors and church leaders are simply trying to stir affections and stir emotions on Sunday mornings, and I know because I did it for a long time. And they go out of their way to create an environment that lends itself to having nothing more than a man-made emotional experience devoid of the Holy Spirit and an authentic encounter with God. Remember, two weeks ago, we taught on, on worship, and we said we wanted our house to be a house of worship, which, by the way, thank you for continuing uh, to sing like you mean it. But two weeks ago when we talked about that, we said that our, our experience here on Sunday mornings, the worship experience, can appeal to the emotions, but it's got to be more than that. It can't just be that. It is that, but it's so much more. A worship gathering also needs to stir our mind, our intellect. Let me remind you what God said through the prophet Hosea. He said this in Hosea chapter 4, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you've rejected knowledge, I will reject you from serving as my priest. Since you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your sons. It's a pretty stark warning. It should not surprise us then that there's a connection between knowing God and knowing his word. Like some, some people think that, that Bible knowledge is, is brainy and it's boring and it's not necessary for a real walk with God, but God and his word are vitally connected to one another. Right? So, so back to Acts chapter 2, as the church is being launched into the world, the apostles are giving these 3,000 new believers, they're giving them knowledge. They're giving them doctrine. They're giving them instruction. I really like what John Stott, uh, who's the great British theologian, he was commenting on Acts chapter 2. He's got some commentaries. And he said this. He said, one might say that the Holy Spirit opened a school in Jerusalem that day. The school teachers were the apostles whom Jesus had appointed and trained, and there were 3,000 new pupils in kindergarten that day. Uh, that sounds overwhelming, doesn't it? <laughs> 3,000 kindergartners, oof. Something else, notice here that there's actually four activities that are listed in verse 42. It's really a list of activities of what they did. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Some would say it's three. It says they have devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship and the breaking of bread. Some will put those two together. And to prayer. But, but I've got them listed as four, right? So, so they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. This is their priority order, and to fellowship, and to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And I, and I want you to notice that at the top of that list is teaching and doctrine. And I bring that up because if you and I were to write that list, I'm not convinced that that's what we would put as number one. Not all of us. Some of us, if, I, if we said, hey, what, what's the most important thing that happens at FBC, at Fellowship Bible Church, what, what should be our priority order? Some of you might write, and, and listen, I'm, I'm, this is a no judgment zone. I'm just saying we probably, with the 400 of us that are in the room, wouldn't all put the same thing as number one. Some of us might write uh, worship or singing is priority number one for us. Or we might write prayer. That's a good thing. We might put missions should, should be the number one thing, or evangelism. But teaching and doctrine, according to the Scripture, teaching and doctrine top their list. And, and so I look at it and I go, well, why is that first on the list? Well, I think it's because it's foundational for everything else. 
I mean, I know we're in a short topical series right now, but it's why I prefer teaching through books of the Bible. It's why we finished Genesis in, you know, 30-something weeks. It's why we're going to start James next week. That's why we like to point out nouns and original languages and word meanings and context and teach all that stuff. You see, I feel a certain weight of responsibility And I know the elders do and other pastors that get up here and handle the word. We feel a certain weight of responsibility when we stand up here and we open up God's word. And on a foundational level, when you come to this gathering each week and we open up uh, God's word together, I feel like one of the things that I'm asking you to do, no matter if you're young in your faith or you mature in your faith, one of the things that I'm asking you to do is to trust God. Like, I'm asking you to to trust God. I'm asking you to put your life in his hands. And if I'm asking you to put your life in his hands, then I think you should know a little bit about him. That's why we focus on teaching the scriptures. As you get to know the Bible, as you get to know the word, you get to know God. In fact, David writes about this eloquently in Psalm 19. He says this, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the expanse proclaims the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour out speech. Night after night, they communicate knowledge. There is no speech. There are no words. Their voice is not heard. Their message has gone out to the whole earth, and their words to the ends of the world. Then in verse 7, he says, the instruction of the Lord is perfect, renewing one's life. The testimony of the Lord is trustworthy, making the inexperienced wise. The precepts of the Lord are right, making the heart glad. The command of the Lord is radiant, making the eyes light up. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are reliable and altogether righteous. They are more desirable than gold. Then an abundance of pure gold and sweeter than honey dripping from a honeycomb. In addition, your servant is warned by them, and in keeping them, there is an abundant reward. Here's what he's saying. He's saying you can look around the world. David says you can look around the world, and you can look at creation. You can look up in the expanse of the night sky, and you can see the Milky Way. And he's like, you can see a beautiful uh, field of flowers. You can notice the beauty of nature, and it will tell you about God. He's glorious. He's powerful. He's creative. But if you really want to know God, he says it starts with instruction and knowledge, and teaching, and doctrine. And so that's the first statement. And cultivating, in our house, cultivating a heart for God's word. To grow, you must learn. Here's the second. To learn, you must hear. Right? Jesus said in Matthew 13, whoever has ears, let him hear. So, so let's go back to Acts 2.42 again. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Right? There's a modifier used here. It's not just any teaching. It's who's teaching? Well, that was not a redundant rhetorical question. It's who's teaching? That's right. So why so specific? Well, I mean, why so specific to let us know that it was the apostles' teaching? Well, this is what I'm guessing, that there were lots of doctrines and teachings that were floating around back then. And, and this is a brand new way Right? This is a brand new religion that's launching on this day. This becomes what we know as Christianity. And so there's lots of other doctrines that are floating around. And they they had to uh, install this foundational doctrine and this teaching. That they're coming out of another religion of Judaism. And so they've got a what's different about this way, what's different about this new way of doing things, right? We had the, the doctrine that was circulating back then of the Pharisees, a very legalistic teaching and a very legalistic doctrine. Then we had the doctrine of the Sadducees, which is a very liberal doctrine and liberal teaching. But this is the apostles' doctrine. And so what does that mean? Well, it simply means this. The apostles were teaching them the scriptures as they related to Jesus primarily, but really all of the Old Testament, and then the things that Jesus had taught them himself. That was it. 
They were teaching them the, the Old Testament, and in particular, the scriptures that applied to Jesus, and then they were teaching them the things that they had learned directly from Jesus, right? Keep in mind, it's always weird when we live on this side, you know, 2,000 years later of, of when all of these things are happening, and so they didn't have the New Testament, right? They didn't have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. They were living those things out in real time. They... they they, they had the Old Testament scriptures. And, and so the apostles were taking the Old Testament scriptures, they're applying it in a New Testament setting. That was the apostles' teaching. In fact, I, I want to show you this. Just go back in Acts chapter 2, just a little bit earlier. Back up to verse 14. Right, the setting here is, remember I told you the Holy Spirit's descended, a bunch of weird things are happening, they're beginning to speak these different languages in their native tongue, they're starting to see these visions of tongues and flames of fire, and, and quite a commotion's happening, and as a result, Peter goes uh, outside, people are wondering what in the world's going on, it says in verse 14, Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and proclaimed to them, Fellow Jews and all you residents of Jerusalem, let this be known to you and pay attention to my words. For these people are not drunk as you suppose, since it's only nine in the morning. That was the accusation that these guys were drunk. And Peter's like, it might be five o'clock somewhere, but not here. It's, it's way too early for that. But then look at verse 16. He says, on the contrary, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. And then he quotes the prophet Joel. And it will be in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all people. Then your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. So what's Peter doing? He's quoting the Old Testament prophet Joel. He's showing them that the scripture has been fulfilled. What, 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 I, what I want you to see is that Peter's sermon is rooted in the text of Scripture. Not some kind of emotion or, or some kind of feeling or some kind of, ah, what do these people need right now? Not, he's not trying to meet a felt need. It's not some kind of opinion. It's rooted in God's Word. Go down a couple of more verses. Jump to verse 23. Peter continues. Though he... Jesus was delivered up according to God's determined plan and foreknowledge. You used lawless people to nail him to a cross and kill him. God raised him up, ending the pains of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by death. For David says of him, and now he quotes Psalm 16, I saw the Lord ever before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Peter showing them the death of Jesus Christ and his resurrection were foretold in Scripture. And he uses the Bible, the Old Testament, to do it. In other words, the teaching of the apostles or the apostles' teaching was, I believe, expository preaching. That's what they're doing. That is, they just let the text speak for itself. See, that's... That's all we're trying to do. Some people go, well, why, why do you do expository preaching? Well, I think it's because we believe that there is power in the word itself. That, that, that I don't need to add a lot to it, that we don't need to do that, that, that we can just come in here and open up our Bibles together and, and that the word is powerful. And it's not based on the personality of the, the preacher, the presenter, whoever's up here talking like God's word is powerful enough by itself to change a life. Paul says this plainly in Romans 10. He says, so faith comes from what is heard and what is heard comes through the message about Jesus Christ. That's enough. I really want you to see that and, and, and understand that the apostles were, were true servants of the word, right? They spoke to the people what God's word said, and they were tethered to the text of Scripture. And then here's the third and final um, decision in cultivating a heart for God's word. To hear, you must commit. And so to grow, you must learn, to, to learn, you must hear, to hear, you must commit. Look back at verse 42 one last time. We were told, since we're taking it in reverse, that they devoted themselves. 
they devoted themselves. Okay, the word for devoted here in, in the Greek is the word proskatero. And it means to steadfastly or to be steadfastly attentive, to continue all the time, to persevere constantly. In other words, this was not an activity um, that they just started and and then uh, got distracted or bored and went on to do other things, right? It's not like somebody came along and said, yeah, you know what? I used to go to the Apostles' Church. I used to listen to the Apostles' Doctrine and their teaching, but honestly, I just wanted something a little bit more dynamic than Peter and those guys were able to deliver, you know, so I just quit going. Do you know how ludicrous that would sound? They devoted themselves. They persevered constantly in the apostles' teaching. What they started, they continued. And here's why that's important. There's an interesting thing about hearing God's truth. Once you stop hearing God's truth for a while, you start growing deaf to its instruction. I mean, anybody besides, you don't have to raise your hand, but like, haven't you been there maybe? You spend time in the Word, you spend time in the Word, and you stop spending time in the Word, and then all of a sudden, right, you just start marginalizing it, you start becoming hardened to its claims. It no longer has authority over your life. Yeah, I know know the Bible says that, but... That's just not where I'm at right now. And it's easy to see why. Because in this culture, in this society today, man, we hear so, so many other voices. That's one of the downsides. I mean, there's some upsides, the social media and cell phones and being connected with, with, you know, with people all around the world instantaneously. But... But the thing is, there's just so many voices, and oftentimes those voices are much louder, and there's more of them. And so unless we're being constantly and consistently exposed to the truth of Scripture, then what we hear day in and day out takes over in terms of its influence in our lives. That's why it's so important to commit, to commit ourselves to God's Word. It's a For lack of a better analogy, it's a spiritual muscle that you have to develop, right? So keep coming to worship each week. And if you need it, start coming at 9 o'clock to one of our adult classes. And if you need it, jump into a small group with others that you can do live together and get into a DNA group uh, and, and start holding others, people, your friends accountable to what you're learning in the scripture and stay yourself rooted uh, in, in your daily solitude in the scriptures, When you persevere in this, you'll find that you're able to persevere in life, right? This is, this is not a secret. It's like, so when you lose your job or when the doctor says, uh, it's cancer and here's, uh, the plan or, um, you know, again, when you, when you lose your job, when devastating things begin to happen in life, when the boyfriend, girlfriend leaves you, heaven forbid your spouse says, you know what? I'm not in love with you anymore, It's like when those things happen that you can fall back into the truth and the promises of God. All of that to simply say that teaching God's word absolutely dominated life in the early church. And learning scriptures, learning the Bible dominated the individual lives of early believers. So we learn that the early church set an example by being immersed in God's word, and they did so continually. That's why we study. That's why we teach. That's why it's always, hey, please, if you have your Bible, turn with me to whatever text. Because when Paul wrote to Timothy about how to conduct himself in church in 1 Timothy, here's what he said. I've written so that you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's house, in God's household, which is the church 
of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. The idea here is that the church holds up the truth, God's word. The church holds up God's word like pillars hold up a temple. The Bible gives us a foundation for life. And, and so that is the reason. That's the reason in our house, we, when we come in here, we open up our Bibles, we set scripture before you because we believe that, that we're setting the Lord himself before you. And so the Bible, God's word, ha has the effect, David said, of, of making the eyes radiant, of enlightening the eyes. We learn it to be mature. We hear it to be instructed, and we persevere constantly in it to be a holy and a healthy church. Amen? Let's pray. Oh, God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your scriptures. We thank you for the Bible. And, and we thank you that it's not just a bunch of people um, saying a bunch of things or giving opinions, but the Holy, the Holy Word, a seamless instrument by which you have spoken to mankind, outlining for us a way to live our lives. And as a church, we want to have a heart for it. We want to be devoted to it, every word of it, from the beginning to the end, for your glory. And so help us in our house, in our church, to have a heart for the word. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.